Welcome to the Next Step in Care learning series. This video is designed to provide healthcare and social service providers with ideas and guidance on ways to work together with family caregivers. Way in their life, but if you're going to see the patient again, uh, if, you, if you recognize the dementia um, the second or third time you see them, uh, that may not necessarily represent a serious problem, but if you miss a diagnosis of delirium, um, that's a very serious problem because delirium is a marker for an unrecognized illness of some kind. Um, and it's also a measure of the severity of a disease that someone has. So someone presents to the emergency department and they have, let's say, uh, bronchopneumonia. If, um, you know, in an older person, um, if they are not unstable in other respects, we would treat this as an outpatient so-called walking pneumonia, give them a, you know, a prescription for an oral antibiotic and uh, hopefully a, a follow-up referral. Um, however, if they had that same condition and they were hypoxic, you would obviously recommend that they would be admitted to the hospital because signs of end organ failure um, are an indication for admitting patients who have an infection to the hospital as opposed to treating them as an outpatient. It's a marker for the severity of the illness. So the patient who has delirium has shown you that they have more serious disease because they have systemic side effects. Now, besides failing to recognize the severity of the disease, you're also putting them at risk for both an accelerated cognitive decline, the patient who does have delirium in the context of their hospitalization is going to have approximately twice the average length of stay. It's much more likely to die in your hospital. And if dis when discharged, if they develop delirium at home, is at high risk for being rehospitalized. And the causes of delirium are multiple, um, with infection being uh, possibly the most common, but medication side effect being way high up there on the list. Um, and among the medications that are uh, most frequently at risk, unsurprisingly, are things that are already playing around with brain chemicals. Uh, so uh, psychotropic medications of all kinds um, are probably the single most common, um, although the anticholinergics um, are way up there as well. Um, and um, in addition to the ones that were on the list that were presented, there are a tremendous number of medications which uh, have mild anticholinergic side effects, including things like Lasix and uh, a wide variety of different uh, cardiac meds and so on, which by themselves might not represent a problem, but in our typical geriatric patient with on 13 different medications, when you begin adding mild anticholinergic side effects together, the newest thing that you added into the regimen you know, may well be the cause. Um, and we're certainly familiar with um, various other kinds of stressors on the body, um, including anesthesia. The anesthesiologists all deny this, but every family caregiver I've ever known uh, confirmed that uh, they were seeing it, particularly with um, general anesthesia, you're likely to have a considerable period of delirium afterwards. And the mere stress of surgery on the body. Uh, metabolic disturbances um, you know, are not as common, but certainly uh, are a, a serious potential cause for uh, delirium. And sensory deprivation of a wide variety of different things. So we admit elderly patients to the hospital. We put them on a regular hospital unit. Their family, of course, recognizes that they're in a dangerous place, so they keep their eyeglasses and their hearing aid at home. And then the patient hallucinates because they think that people are muttering strange things about them in the hallway and that there's a worrisome object in the corner that they can't identify. And sensory deprivation leads to hallucinations and delusions and um, is a major risk factor for the development of, um, of delirium, particularly in the hospital setting, uh, because we, we subconsciously uh, alter people's sensory environment um, with loud and frightening noises mingled in with um, deprivation of things that they're usually used to. And uh, many of the hospital-based programs to decrease the risk of delirium concentrate on changing the hospital's sensory environment to something that's more supportive for uh, an elderly patient. Now, um, there was a recently published article reviewing uh, diagnostic criteria and screening tests for the identification of delirium um, superimposed on dementia. There, um, and for the recognition of delirium, we are largely talking about something called the confusion assessment method. 
which then, of course, because we're, there should be scientific, gets moved into the confusion assessment method algorithm. Um, and then the instrument. I don't know. It's, it's not musical. It's a, it's a testing, uh, a ten-item test. But apparently, one is always supposed to call tasks instruments. Um, but the algorithm essentially says, is there acute onset? Um, is there fluctuation? And then, is there either disorder, disorganized thinking or altered level of consciousness? And that's essentially, those are the key elements you're looking for if you have uh, the acute onset and fluctuation, and then one or the other of the other two, then you can, uh, with a high degree of sensitivity and specificity, recognize delirium. Now, um, in one of the things that's remarkable is, in fact, how rarely um, delirium is recognized in hospital settings, even though we're um, supposed to be quite keyed into this as a concern. Um, and in fact, um, in 2000, um, a nursing professor named Donna Fick, who's one of the more published people in educating nurses about recognizing delirium, published a, an article with another author um, in which she um, compared the accuracy of uh, bedside nurses, um, neurologists, geriatricians, uh, general interests, who were following patients in the hospital to see how frequently they were recognizing delirium um, that was uh, diagnosable in their patients. And, found that, in fact, um, all four of those professional groups uh, were recognizing at 30% or less at the time that it was present. Um, and in a kind of aside in the article, um, which I quoted, but I don't think it led her to do the later research, um, she mentions in passing that family caregivers at the bedside recognized it over 90% of the time. So this then uh, ultimately has led to the FAM camp which is actually the family confusion <laughs> assessment method, identification of delirium. Um, and this has now been um, validated and published. Um, and if you look at the authors here, I don't know how many of you are familiar with any of these names, but Lois Evans is a, a nursing professor from the University of Pennsylvania, probably the heroine of the um, restraint reduction movement and a internationally well-known uh, um, geriatric nurse uh, educator, Donna Thick, again being published. Sharon Nui um, is a geriatrician from Harvard and probably the nation's leading expert on delirium. So um, when I'm saying that these are, these are the experts in the field, okay, telling you um, how to recognize um, uh, delirium, uh, and this was a study done in a hospital setting um, with um, 54 pairs of caregivers that were um, instructed um, uh, to identify those key elements of confusion. And the confusion assessment, the FAM CAM, is simply the CAM when done by a family caregiver. Okay? It's that exact same algorithm. They ask them for those key elements. Do you recognize these things? Are they fluctuating? Did this happen acutely? Has this fluctuation been more than you expect from your loved one uh, that you're used to? Um, and they discovered that, in fact, um, this was uh, had a 94% uh, specificity in the identification of um, delirium in a hospital setting. And this is a quote from that article that, in the recent journal of the American Geriatric Society. So um, what they're essentially telling you is that there is a kind of healthcare professional who was at your bedside okay, who has, in fact, a tremendous ability to recognize a key clinical finding um, that will be extremely helpful in the care of this, of, uh, of this patient. 